Hey guys, it's Alex from Fast Fitness Tips. Triathlon Taran just dropped a video about the difference between disc wheels and deep dish wheels. Basically, he's gone to quite some lengths, and this is pretty admirable, to test these wheels in a field test where he did test at 175 watts and a test at 225 watts. And although the results were expected at 225 watts, i.e. the disc wheel propelled him faster than just the simple deep dish wheel. In the slower speed scenario, which was 175 watts, he actually found the opposite to what we normally expect. In other words, he found that in his field test, the disc wheel was slower. And he said that, quoting Cameron Worth, discs are only valuable at high speed. And... Uh, to be honest, <laughs> I'm taking issue with this. And in fact, a few people write to us, check out the comments on Triathlon Taran's video. Essentially, the test is actually flawed. Now, look, I don't want to criticize him because he's done a lot of work here and it's a very easy to mistake to make. So I'm going to cover the key reason for this being flawed right now. And I'm going to call it... <laughs> Cycling terms in five minutes, variability index. Because what we're talking about here, yeah, what we're talking about is the variability index and how it influences riders. And you may or may not be aware of variability index. If you're not aware of it, a really simple way of thinking about it is high variability index means you're burning matches during your ride. Your effort is not perfectly even. To put it in more mathematical terms is simply the ratio of normalized power to average power. But hang on a second, what is normalized power? Well, there is a formula Andy Cog in, invented. It involves a 30 second rolling average and raising the power to the fourth power, averaging the resulting values and then rooting it back. Look, it doesn't matter what the formula is. The point is, what does it actually mean? Normalized power essentially means it's what the physiological cost of that ride would be. Okay, it's kind of like the strain on you. What's the strain, yeah? Well, the average power is literally the mean power over time. That's what the bike is receiving. So effectively, the average power in normal circumstances is much more akin to the speed of the bike. So if you want to make it really simple, think of the variability index as the strain in terms of power versus the speed in terms of power. That actually works quite well conceptually. Now, what does it mean in terms of the number? Well, if you've got a variability index of 1.0, it means the power is completely even throughout. Now, you don't see that very often in normal riding. You'd have to basically be on the turbo trainer with the difficulty uh, turned down to zero. It's not a bad workout, actually, just to have a constant ride in some situations, but it's not really representative of the outdoors, you know, of the real world. The more bumpy the course, the more hilly the course, and the variability index is going to go up, maybe 1.1 or even 1.2 if it's like a really crazy race where you're overshooting on your power, you know, your effort is really not even at all, like a road race criterion, something like that. But returning to the idea of, triathlon or TT rides, you really want your variability, variability index to be under 1.1, really under 1.04 on flat courses. So that can be an objective if you like. On a hilly course or under special circumstances, you might want to take it a bit higher than that. Let's say the upper threshold would be 1.08. Now what it means in reality, if you take this example you know, I was trying to think of a way, how would we convert the meaning of variability index into kind of the effect on your ride? And I was thinking about clever ways to do this, but we don't need a clever way because Triathlon Taran has done it for us. Because what his test is in this video is actually a test of variability index, not so much a test of disc wheels. So what he actually did in terms of the wheels, he changed the wheel but he also rode, he rode in different conditions. So this is interesting. This is what he did. He rode at what he was trying to achieve at 175 watts. But actually, with the disc wheel on board, 
he um, managed to get a variability index of 1.07. Now remember, variability index is NP over AP. So the average power, even though his normalized power was 175, was down at 165 for the uh, disk wheel, which means that his ride on the disk wheel would be lower because the bike is seeing 165 watts. Now, when he put the deep dish wheel on, he rode at 1.01, .01, and he also managed a normalized power of 177, which means the average power was 176. So basically, you've got disc wheel, the bike seeing 165, and deep dish wheel, the bike seeing 176. There's a 10 watt difference there, and that is reflected in the speed of those rides, the difference in the speed of those rides. In fact, the difference in speed of the rides exceeds the benefit of the disc wheel itself. So the aero benefit of the disc wheel, I'll come back to that, is exceeded by the abnormality, if you like, in the variability index. And that tells us something really important, that the variability index of about 1.05 on a flat course, if you're exceeding that, is the equivalent to taking off a disc wheel and putting on a deep wheel. In other words, you know, the benefit is actually as bad as going like one step down in your equipment. That is a very useful take home message. And that's basically what Triathlon Taran has demonstrated today. Now, I hear you asking, why then does a low variability index influence speed in this way? Why is it better, like in terms of riding physics, to have a low variability index? Well, here's an example. Imagine that you've got a one hour TT, which you break into three sections. But in the first section, you ride 19 minutes pretty hard. And then you soft pedal for one minute. Let's say you repeat that three times, but you want to catch up with the average rider who just rode one hour at a steady average pace. Clearly having rested for each of those one minutes during the ride, well, soft pedal, let's say you watts going down to zone one, you're really going to have to go hard on that 19 minutes to catch up, yeah? Okay, it's a ridiculous example, but think about it. You still rode for the same hour, but what's going to happen is your normalized power is going to be huge, even though your average power might be the same. In trying to catch up your average speed, your normalized power is going to be super high. And here's the problem. Think about it a second. When you try and catch up, you're going to go significantly faster than average. Your average speed in the catch-up phase is going to be higher, of course. And that means there's a problem because drag is basically, you know, synonymous with the square of velocity. Most people say power is close to the cube of velocity. And therefore, Houston, we have a problem. You know, you cannot just go easy, go hard and expect to do the same effort in the ride. It's going to be a disproportionately high effort because of the effect of trying to match the speed at more than average speed and the effect on drag, basically. OK, but is there a situation then where high variability index is good? Because if you look at the Strava traces or if you look at the WKO traces of pro riders, you'll find that a lot of them have high variability index, even in some triathlon or time trial events. Well, the reason for that is that in some situations where the speed or velocity on the bike is low, it is necessary to overpower on the bike to overcome, let's say, a short obstacle, typically a climb. But it could be riding into a headwind temporarily. It could even be catching up with the draft, you know, catching up with the pack. So there are some situations when going overpowered, the physiological costs actually out, is outweighed by the speed benefit. Or to put this in everyday terms, in everyday cycling terms, when the VI is high, you are burning matches, but that's what matches are for. They're there to be burned when the benefit is more than the cost. As a quick bonus for you guys, let me quickly rewind to Cameron Worth's statement that discs are only beneficial when you're going fast, i.e. 40 or 45 kilometers per hour. The other thing about a disc is, is really beneficial when you're going at least above 40k an hour, more like 45k an hour. So anything sort of less than that, 
you really should just probably go with deep section rims. Okay, this isn't correct, but it's a really common uh, mistake. And I'll have to show you in data why this is a mistake. Just bear with me for one minute here. So what I've done here is I've modeled the speed on the bike if the rider is going at various powers, 100 to 350 watts. And this is the speed with a disc wheel. This is a speed with a deep dish wheel, obviously with more inferior wheels like Shallow or Mavic Open Pro, you know, you're gonna have a major difference. The difference between disc and Zip 808 is fairly subtle. And by the way, this is modeled with the same kind of front wheel, but just changing the rear, okay? So on the left-hand graph here, this is the difference in speed that you get by going up in the power. In red, we've got the deep dish, uh, Zip 808 in this case, and in blue, we've got the disc wheel, okay? So basically what we see, actually like Cameron Worth hints, is the more powerful the rider, they're going at faster speed. This is a zero gradient, by the way. There's a bigger separation the faster you go. So speed does differ. The, the difference in speed when you upgrade your equipment to disc does improve more the faster you're going or the more powerful the rider. So he is correct about that one thing. But actually, in nearly all races, in fact, every race, we're not actually concerned with your raw speed. We're concerned with how fast do you finish the course. So this is the time on the course for the two equipments. Let's start with a 40K TT. So there's a 100, 200, 300 watt rider. So clearly the faster you're going, the shorter time you're on course. With a 40K TT, a 300 watt rider, is modeled to complete it in 56.8 minutes with a disc compared to 57.9 without a disc, a difference of 1.09 um, or one minute, six seconds. But look at this, the more weaker rider or the beginner who's let's say putting out just 150 watts, look at this line here, their difference by upgrading to disc is gonna save them one minute 24. And the 100 watt rider, if there was such a thing, is gonna save 138. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, the 350 watt rider is only gonna save 59 seconds. Yes, there's a bigger difference in speed, but they're on course for much shorter time. Now this is a little dynamic calculator. Let's put half Iron Man in there, 90K. You can see our beginner, raw beginner, is gonna save you know, over three minutes. Whereas our Neo Pro is going to save around about two minutes. And in the full Ironman, the beginner is going to save around seven minutes by upgrading to disc. And the Pro is going to um, only save about four minutes. So there you go, guys. Boom. That is why this area is misunderstood. Aero does help beginners as much and probably more in terms of time saved even though the difference in speed fractionally favors the stronger rider. All right, guys, this is Coach Alex from Fast Fitness Tips. Please check out our Strava Club, check out our social media, and above all, check out our YouTube channel. Thanks for your attention, guys. Big up to Triathlon Taron. And if you like this concept of cycling terms in five minutes, give this a like or share. And if it's popular, yeah, I'll make another one. All right, guys, take care.